So we've talked a lot on this show about how the British press often seem like they want to cover for government mistakes when it comes to COVID-19. That's especially the case on the most popular broadcast, so something like the BBC News at 6 or 10, where you'll see the political editor Laura Koonsberg or the health editor Hugh Pym say that we shouldn't be too harsh on the government when mistakes are made because this crisis is both unprecedented and could not have been foreseen. Um, we talk a lot on this show about why we think that it probably should have been foreseen, even if they couldn't have guessed precisely when it would happen. Uh, but it's also interesting to look at how other countries, so not just you know left-wing podcasts like our own, but centrist establishment media in other countries is approaching and is addressing and is covering the British response to coronavirus. Um, they don't always seem quite as forgiving as the Koonsbergs and the Pims of this world. I want us to take a look at a CNN report from this weekend to find out how the rest of the world is looking at Britain's response to COVID-19. Britain, it's close to having Europe's worst death toll. So what did it do wrong or differently? When global alarm bells were ringing loudly, the UK was clear it wouldn't lock down too early and that some spread was unavoidable, even desirable. <coughs> if people go too early, they become very fatigued. It's not possible to stop everybody getting it. And it's also actually not desirable because you want some immunity in the population. Hindsight always gives a clearer, unfair verdict. But new updated government figures show the death toll just in England was a lot larger than known at the time in the days leading up to lockdown. When the Prime Minister said he was still shaking hands. And I shook hands with everybody, uh, you'll be pleased to know. And no deaths were announced Four people had already died in England when Cheltenham horse races criticised for going ahead ended. The UK toll was officially 10 when really 58 had died. And when the lockdown slammed pub doors shut publicly, the toll was 359, but really 847 had died in England alone. Should the UK have moved faster? Testing and contract tracing was a problem from the start, partially dismissed and then heavily embraced. 100,000 tests per day. Many grand schemes were announced. Home antibody test, apps, a volunteer army. But this one actually happened, nearly on time, albeit late. It can't have helped decision-making that Boris Johnson was nearly killed by the disease too at its peak. Still, despite the huge toll, the UK's health service was not overwhelmed. Even huge overflow hospitals like this in London were barely used. Half those who died in England so far were over 80. Did the UK not protect them enough? Or was there little that could be done? Tough questions that time and grief will answer. I mean, how often have you seen that incredibly important, actually, clip of Patrick Valance saying that suppressing the spread of COVID-19 is not desirable? I mean, that, that seems like that's a key piece of evidence to suggest that the government's policy was herd immunity, uh, which uh, I suppose political editors have potentially been intimidated out of out of repeating, even though we all, we all know it. Um, that fact that the deaths at lockdown were 847, that's now, we know that now because of the Office for National Statistics data. I've seen that in the FT. I haven't seen that on, on British television. And that's on CNN in one of their reports, which is summarizing what has been Britain's response to coronavirus. And this is CNN. It's Again, it's not, a, it's not a leftist channel in the United States. This is the, the, the most centrist channel they have, in fact. Um, and again, this idea that they say that the, the um, target for testing was reached late. Now, that's something that the BBC won't admit if you watch the news there. But they don't even say it's controversial. They say, of course, it was it was met late um, because 100,000 tests did not happen. Uh, what did you think of that report? How different did you think that was to what we normally see on the British press? And why is it that it is other countries that can cover the reality of what is going on in Britain, but our political editors are so incapable of having an objective perspective of what's going on, asking difficult questions and admitting what is obviously the truth, even if it is uncomfortable for the current government. Well, look, our media is particularly stupid. And and and, and that's the, that is the best explanation that I can give. I mean, 
American broadcast television, you know, with the hairspray and the teeth is more obviously deranged. But in this country, the rot goes much, much deeper. And you could see it on Friday with the announcement of 122,000 tests being dispatched. And immediately the BBC covers that as they've hit the 100,000 people being tested target, 100,000 tests carried out. So the BBC were leading with a fundamentally misleading headline. And that was going out on push notifications. That was the top line. And it fundamentally wasn't true. And then when you bring this up and you go, look, the expansion of testing capacity to around 73, 74,000 is huge. That's amazing. However, that's not the same as carrying out the tests. The use Mm. of the tests isn't, you know, everyone gets to you know, feel alive and a little bit kinky by shoving a swab up their nostrils. The value of the test is the data that it gives back. It gives us a picture of how many people have got it in the community, how many people will be immune and how many people are at risk if they're in contact with these people who are obviously infected. Now, if you're counting a dispatch test the same as a successfully completed one, there's a huge problem with your data. And we've seen immediately after that date, the number of dispatched tests has plummeted mm. by over a quarter. So now it's around 70,000 being dispatched and before we even get to how many are successfully completed. So when you're a, you know, a blue tick, shall we say, and you see these criticisms, you look at the people who are making them. So Corbyn supportive Twitter accounts, the usual suspects of Michael, Aaron, me, Owen Jones, and you go, oh, these leftist loudmouths nitpicking again. It's obviously a partisan attack. I dislike the left so much and I find them so personally aggravating. I will make a temporary but powerful alliance with the pestilence here. So I'm going to be team coronavirus, going to say everything is going swimmingly because I dislike the left so much. So yes, there are obviously vested interests between the establishment media, the government of the day and certain big money interests. That's all true. But other countries do it better. They're not any less capitalist than our country. They're not any less riven by class and exploitation than our country. Ours is just a bit dumber. It's a, I think it's also potentially that distance gives you a bit more clarity, although I do agree with most of what you've just said there. Uh, so I'm going to go to Aaron in a second. First of all, I want to show you that it's not just this one clip from CNN, uh, which shows that the foreign press is more capable of applying proper scrutiny to our government than our own. Um, so this was a piece from Australia's paper of record, the, so the Sydney Morning Herald. This was from yesterday, the headline, Biggest failure in a generation, where did Britain go wrong? So unlike Italy, the United Kingdom had time to prepare for the coronavirus tsunami. But as the death doll climbs, critics say Britain's response has suffered from a series of deadly mistakes and miscalculations. So I think something that you notice, especially when you're looking at at the foreign press on on Britain is that they notice that Britain's response is exceptional, is, 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 is an outlier. Um, whereas what we're always told is, you know, we're we're in this group of European countries and we're following on the same trajectory. But obviously that ignores the fact that Italy didn't have any warning. Um, talking of Italy, which was the country which was hit first and is still the worst hit country in Europe. Although, I mean, Britain looks like it is going to overtake them in terms of the death toll fairly soon. Um, they have been equally damning of Britain's response. So I first want to take a look at their paper, Republica. Um, So this is an article from their equivalent of The Guardian. This is from last week. So the United Kingdom, from herd immunity to mass delays, all the mistakes of the Johnson government. That's the headline. And then uh, a quote here. COVID-19 is an invisible enemy and in many ways still unknown. And many countries, such as Italy itself, have made several mistakes. But the confusion and contradictions that have been seen in the British government in recent months have few equals. Now, that, that is not the kind of thing that you would normally hear in the British press, which would, you know, is, is wanton to admit the idea that Britain could have dealt with this significantly worse than many other countries. You know, there's say so we shouldn't we shouldn't compare at this point in time. Uh, if you look back at Italy's coverage when the key decisions were being made, it is even more damning. 
right? You know, when, so when, when the bodies were piling up in Italy and our government was being particularly cavalier, um, they were watching on in horror. Um, this is an article from March in their centre-right newspapers. This is the equivalent of the Times or the Telegraph there. Um, reporting on Boris Johnson's speech when he said that many of your loved ones will die and we're going to pursue a herd immunity policy. Go to a quote from that. The phrase is shocking. Many families will lose their loved ones, but the reaction is perhaps even more chilling. We will do nothing because this is the line chosen by the government of Boris Johnson, forward as if nothing had happened. Britain separates itself from the rest of Europe while governments on the continent take increasingly drastic measures. London literally washes their hands. The fundamental advice against coronavirus is in fact to use soap and water. Those who have symptoms are invited to stay home for a week, but otherwise it's business as usual, no closures, no emergency. Life in London continues to flow as normal and no one goes around with a mask. Now, if that kind of thing had been written in the British centre-right papers back in March, that would have been very helpful because potentially we would have entered into a lockdown and had proper social distancing measures much earlier. And then we could have you know, avoided the mass deaths that we have currently seen. If we'd looked at Italy and said, that's the future, we don't want that, and responded accordingly, we could have had a much, much lower death toll. But obviously, you know, the the press here, especially the centre-right press, were blinded by their proximity to the UK government and only worked out three weeks late that that response then was irresponsible. Aaron. Yeah, we've talked a lot about herd immunity. Let's talk about herd mentality. I think the, the British media has a herd mentality problem, which is worse than anywhere else. Uh, and this isn't actually a personal failing of particular individuals, although many of those individuals are failures as journalists, there's also structural explanations. The BBC accounts for 80% of radio and TV uh, news in this country, which means that if you have a political editor uh, and a couple of leading lights who make bad calls, it reflects incredibly poorly on the entire organisation. That, that's just a fact. And when people say, oh, you're being so hard on Laura Koonsberg or Robert Peston or Andrew Neil, Peston now ITV, of course, formerly at the BBC, well, you should be because they are playing such a major role in the country's national life. Alongside the BBC having that extraordinary share of, uh, of, of broadcast news is the fact that we, we live in an incredibly centralised country. And I mean, really, England with London. And it's important to say, actually, oh, you shouldn't put, you know, put, shouldn't put the country down, et cetera, et cetera. These aren't the kinds of criticisms you get from, from Scottish public opinion. I don't know, Welsh public opinion is the same extent. It's very much an English thing. Now, if you look at the United States, you have a, a national newspaper in Chicago, in L.A., more so in Washington, Washington Post, New York Times, uh, you have multiple senses of, of opinion. Uh, if you look in Italy, you're just talking about La Repubblica, you have Milan, you have Rome, um, to a lesser extent you have Florence, you have Naples, but you have multiple poles of, again, public conversation. Rome is the is the administrative capital, but you know, the financial capital is really in Milan, you've got Torino, Turin as well. And so I think it's this convergence of two major issues. The fact we have a public service broadcaster, which in actually a, a crisis situation becomes a state broadcaster, combined with the fact we don't really have any major media cities beyond London, I think it becomes a really big issue. Uh, and that, again, that's quite new. You know, The Guardian until I think 1950 was, 1950 was based in Manchester. Uh, so it's quite new, the idea that all of your journalists live in one city. Uh, you have a similar issue with France, uh, but I don't think it's quite as bad as it is here. Then finally, that idea of news only being uh, the bad stories are only the ones you report abroad. That's actually that's quite a, a traditional thing. In the 17th century, when you're getting newspapers for the first time, they'd be given gazette as a Venetian word, by the way. You would get a, a license to, to, to publish news on the condition that you only published bad news abroad. Uh, that, that's not a new phenomenon. Uh, and so to that extent, you could understand why CNN might report uh, what's going on in Britain, perhaps a bit better, more accurately than it would in the United States, because a foreign eye actually is a bit more impartial, has uh, less issues with regards to bias. And the BBC in particular, of course, has issues with regards to domestic funding. The government of the day can just cut the tether or impose new editorial constraints and so on. So I, I think it's always been a problem. Uh, has been for hundreds of years and across many places. But the fact that we have such an establishment ensconced in one city and we have this state broadcaster, it's a very, very, very bad mixture. Actually, I think it's a recipe for disaster. 
I think that point about London, actually, it's sort of, it, it, it's not commented on that often because it seems almost too crude an analysis. You know, like Marxists like to talk about the media as, as part of the, the state apparatus, the ideological state apparatus, you know, so it's talking about how, you know, their function in society is to shore up support for the government. But a simpler explanation is they all are kind of best friends. Like lo lo lots of the political editors are married to politicians or people who work for politicians. And so you can, uh, I think it really does cloud people's judgment when they say, well, it seems kind of mad, the policies they're pursuing. But I sat next to Patrick Valance at a dinner party recently, and he seemed like a really reasonable guy. So I should mm. probably believe what he said. Like, I, I, I think actually that probably is a, a reasonable analysis of, yeah. of how Britain's press covered this particular crisis. Before I go to you, Ash, I just want to show uh, the most stupid example of our servile press, which of course was the front page of The Sun this morning, uh, a splash on Boris Johnson. Uh, of his experience in ICU, baby gave me will to live. Um, so this is on the front page of our most popular newspaper, obviously, The Declining Sun, uh, <laughs> but it still is the paper with the widest circulation in this country. Um, obviously, a couple of problems with this headline. One, if you're one of his previous children, so this is his seventh child, so the idea is he was there in ICU thinking, is it worth me living? The first child wasn't enough to get him through it. The second, third, fourth, fifth, potentially sixth child, they weren't enough to think, yeah, it's really worth getting through this illness. It was only the seventh that made the difference. Um, the other problem is, is clearly, what does he think about the 28,000 people whose lives were taken by coronavirus? Did they not have a child they were excited enough to see in the future? In any case, it's a complete joke that this would get put on the front page of a daily newspaper in a country with a free press where you're not at risk of being sent to a gulag unless you publish this kind of nonsense. Mm -hmm.